name is Jared Moyer. I'm with Bankers Compliance Consulting, and I'm just going to set up the show here today. Uh, Kevin Edwards is going to be the presenter for the program today. He's going to be taking your questions and trying to provide the best plain English to answer that we can along the way. Now, in addition to Kevin, I've got several teammates working behind the scenes today. Kyla Kroger, our training coordinator, she's going to be handling the chat function. She's going to be taking care of your experience if you have any audio, visual, technological issues. I've got Diane Dean working the Q&A button, and uh, Amy Kudlanchik is also working behind the scenes as well today, and I'll pick up the slack wherever I can and help out as well. But with that, the goal is to get to as many of your BSA AML compliance questions as we can in the next hour. Again, being recorded, write down the time if you need to go back and and rehash something or listen to it again. Uh, With that, Kevin, the the, the baton is yours. I'm going to let you get to the, the questions that everybody's looking forward to the answers to. Okay. And I think Diane's going to jump on and, and read the questions because the uh, last thing you want me to is read my own questions and then answer them. So uh, Diane, I, I think you can go ahead and get started. Okay. Is it okay for an institution to decide to not allow non-resident aliens to open any deposit accounts due to BSA risk, or would that be considered a discriminatory practice? All right. Well, that that's actually a, a, a very good question. Uh, so here's the thing: nothing in the in the Bank Secrecy Act or nothing in BSA says one way or the other that they, they don't restrict you from you know n- not allowing non-resident aliens to open an account. However, you know it's, it it seems discriminatory. And uh, if you look at Reg B, I believe in in the commentary in Reg B. It does say, you know, because that's the fair lending regulation that's out there. And that's where they talk about discrimination. And it says, you know, you it's not per se discrimination to not give a loan out to a customer who is a non-resident alien. That being said, I have also heard attorneys come in and say, yeah, well, maybe Reg B says that, but it still might be a civil rights regular violation. So now we're talking about, I I believe they said uh, they they were talking about deposit accounts, and there is no fair deposit regulation out there, not like lending where there's Reg B. Um, However, we have UDAP coming in over the top of that that says that uh, any discriminatory practice is uh, is inherently abusive. So um, now while I, you know, so there isn't anything that specifically says you can't do it, um, but that being said, from a you know, just a, just a bank wide perspective, it's getting to be a harder practice to defend. So um, I would, I would really hesitate to just going through and drawing that, that line. Now under the Bank Secrecy Act, it says you can manage your own risk. Uh, But that being said, there's a lot out there that says, you know, that, that is really kind of leaning towards the practice that, or the idea that, that it may be discriminatory. So while I could defend you, it's getting to be a tougher defense to make. As a regulated institution, I've always understood that loan participations with another financial institution are excluded from the third-party CIP requirements. During a recent exam, we were informed we must have contracts and annual reviews under the reliance provision. I provided the FAQ and was told the exception does not apply if we fund only a portion of the participation. What is your interpretation? You know, uh, if you're getting involved with the participation, uh, the the general rule, uh, I would say, or the rule of thumb that go by is you have to do something. You have to have something in place where you can document because this is a new relationship. It's a new account. Um, You're getting involved. So you need to document what exactly are you doing from a CIP and customer due diligence perspective. So I would say um, you'll definitely probably want in the absence of having that information yourself, you want to at least have enough information about the relationship in that participation so you can affirmatively state we're comfortable with what the lead bank is doing, perhaps, and you can show that they have taken that on. But uh, keep in mind, you still have an independent customer due diligence requirement that's out there. Now, that can vary based on risk. Uh, but but I would I would agree with your examiner says that you do have to have at least something. Uh, it may not be as extensive as what you do for a typical lending scenario, um, but but you can't just take your hands off the wheel and say no, there's an exception, so we don't have to do anything here. Should certificate of deposits and loans be considered for analysis from a customer due diligence perspective? 
Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, there's a there's a broad definition of what is an account uh, when we talk about BSA and and all of your customers get some level of customer due diligence. So now that level of customer due diligence will vary depending on the risk that you determine for a particular product or service. Uh, but uh, yeah, every customer you have has to get at least some level of customer due diligence. We file suspicious activity reports on all potential fraudulent transactions or BSA violations of 5,000 plus, regardless of whether we know the suspect. This is based on the wording in the regulation of 5,000 or more that involve potential money laundering or violations of the BSA. Would all such transactions require SR or are we over filing? Now, the, the decision to file a SAR is inherently subjective. So, I mean, there's 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 clear, uh, you do have leverage to make your own decision on a, on a lot of these, but uh, I can kind of see your interpretation. Uh, the definition of money laundering is, is very, very broad. Um, you know, if you detect a transaction that, uh, you know, was, was conducted knowing that there was illegal, that it was the proceeds of illegal activity. So I could see where you come to that conclusion that really all fraud is money laundering. Um, that being said, I don't think that's how most financial institutions interpret that. And my concern is, I believe they said it's every potential fraud. And if you're just filing it across the board based on potential fraud, um, what I'm worried about is that you're not fully investigating these things. Um, you do have the obligation. If you run into suspicious activity, you should be investigating it and coming to your own determination of whether or not a fraud is, or I mean, a, a SAR is necessary. So my concern with this overfiling or this, this fact that you've just kind of drawn a line in the sand, while I, I, I can maybe defend your interpretation, my concern is, is that you're not fully investigating these things. So uh, that's kind of, a, kind of a mouthful, but I would say you, you are probably overfiling if, if that's your line in the sand. So this one is kind of related and just asking, do you see other institutions only filing when the 25,000 threshold is reached, when there is no suspect? Right, right. And, you know, again, it's inherently subjective uh, and there's nothing that that requires you or mandates you to disclose if you don't meet the technical requirements of the act. So if you, if you don't have a, a suspect identified and you haven't reached that threshold, um, they, they shouldn't be citing you for, for not filing a SAR. Now, that being said, uh, you know, I do see other institutions uh, exercising their discretion in filing SARs in some cases, and it may be below that $25,000 mark. Uh, but like I said, it, it's really up to you to conduct your investigation and then, you know, make your determination clear in your documentation on why or, or why you did not file that SAR. Part three of a suspicious activity report, lines 56 and 68, ask for the institutions and branches role in the transactions. How do you decide if a place is the selling or paying location or both? And are we the paying location only when we are actually cashing a check? I, I, I believe in answering what to say, yes, you are, you're right on. You are, if you are uh, cashing the check, then you are the, the paying location. Um, or if the money's going out of the instant, you know, that, that branch or whoever's filing it, then you're the paying uh, institution. I believe that's what they're asking there. Do you feel it is okay to specifically name a group of individuals, for example, the Amish or similar individuals or groups, and a description of acceptable identification in our CIP policy, or could this be discriminatory? Ah, uh, that's another discrimination question. That it does get a little tricky there. So, um, if I were writing up a, a procedure, I would focus on the specific issue or the specific problem that's being presented, um, rather than calling out a specific group. Um, so, in other words, the problem here is, uh, you know, certain uh, customers that you have, they have a lack of normal documentary verification documents. And that's due to their religious beliefs or practices. And um, so I would lay it out that way. And then if you wanted to, for clarity purposes, then come around and, and use that, that community as an example, um, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't 
have a problem with that because that makes your your procedure a little more clear. Um, but I don't think so. I don't think it's a specific. It's a problem to specifically name the group. I would just um, lay out what the issue is uh, in a not you know with it, you know specifically what the problem is, and then lay out your non documentary process that you're going to have in place that the bank deems it is acceptable. So. We have a local grocery store owned by a listed company that changed their name. We filed a designation of exempt person form using the listed company's name, but do we need to file an amended form with the new alternate name? Um, yes, there's actually a box on that designation of exempt person form uh, for specifically for updates. And I would say, yes, if they've changed the name or the information that you have filed, is is out of date or if it changes then i would i would update that information are you aware of any analysis that has been done to indicate the ratio of high risk customers versus low risk customers and what a good sweet spot would be um there's there's not a ratio that i'm i am aware of now it's possible that uh your your examiners may have some internal ratios because i know uh, they're required to do some scoping on the front end when they come in and do a review. But really, that scoping is to determine whether or not they have the resources or if they need additional people on that review. So um, I don't believe there is a, a sweet spot that's out there, high risk to low risk, because really all of this is uh, it's it's inherently subjective. What I would focus more on is making sure that uh, you've updated your risk assessment, that you've identified all of your areas of risk and that you're mitigating that risk appropriately. Um, you know, I, it really, it, it comes down to mitigating the risk that you've identified as opposed to trying to meet some magic number ratio sweet spot for high risk to low risk. I, I, I wouldn't focus on that. Can you review an example of the continuous SAR filing timelines? For example, if we identify suspicious activity on 410 and file the initial SAR on that same day. And then they're asking, when is the 90 re review supposed to start and be completed by and the deadline for the continuous SAR to be filed? Okay. That's uh com this is this is a, a kind of a sticky area. And really the, you know, I I know they say they they caught it on 410. So I'm not I'm not gonna give specific dates. Let me just kind of lay it out the way that it's laid out in, in one of the uh, the SAR FAQs. It, it makes it a little easier to understand. So you've identified the suspicious activity um, and then you have 30 days to file your initial SAR. Okay, so that let's say that's day 30. Then there's that 90 day review process. So you have day 30 and then you add 90 days onto that. Now you look at that 90 day period and you have 30 days after the 90 days, so now we're clear out, if we lay it out that way, we're at day 120. So you have 30 days after your 90 days to file that SAR. So now we're clear out to day 150. The logic being in the course of 12 months, um, you're going to file three SARs over the course of that 12 months. But so in the example that they gave, if you've got your, if you've identified the activity and you filed your SAR on that same day, then I would say you have 90 days from when you filed that SAR. And then at that point, that's when you can look back at those previous 90 days and you have 30 days to file that continuing activity, SAR. This next one has a few different parts, all concerning marijuana-related businesses or MRBs. Uh, we define MRBs by three tiers, tier one being the most risky, that is a dispensary or cultivator, and tier three being the least risky. In this definition, a commercial property owner leasing to a marijuana dispensary would be a tier three. Have you heard anything that regulators would consider or expect banks to consider utility companies an MRB, more specifically a tier three MRB based on our definition? Oh, that's that's a pretty good question because here's the problem. The, the guidance that came out for the marijuana-related businesses um, it doesn't have a de minimis exception or it doesn't say, OK, you know, if it's a really small transaction, then you don't have to file the SAR. Uh, unfortunately, it says if you detect activity that is likely to be from the proceeds from the sale of marijuana, that would trigger this, you know, kind of low level SAR. Um, now, so there, there isn't an exception out there. So the example of the utility company, even though it might be a tiny drop in the bucket, 
you know, if you look at the guidance, that's what it says. Now, that being said, I have talked to banks and I have gotten some kind of informal guidance uh, that uh, allows banks to really define this in their program. Uh, so, you know, maybe it's possible for you to establish that de minimis exception and, and lay it out in your program and say, look, this utility company, and maybe you put it in your customer risk profile and say, yes, this utility company is likely getting some arbitrary payments out there from the proceeds of marijuana, but we're not going to file a SAR every, every time. Um, if you're going to do that, because I know there is, has been some um, guidance out there saying you might have the ability to define that in your program, what I would do is include triggers that, you know, in that logic or in your program, if you've defined it that way, when would you file a SAR and then and then stick to that now? So unfortunately, in the absence of clear guidance that says that you can actually do that, I, it's really hard to uh, you know address every scenario that pops up. Um, I just do know that some financial institutions, they are setting up their, their marijuana-related business program, and they are carving out some of those exceptions, and it has passed muster from some of their examiners. So, How about are we expected to file marijuana-limited SARS on a commercial property owner leasing their property to a marijuana dispensary based simply on this fact? Yes. And that, that's actually pretty clear in the guidance. So they're, they're pretty clear that if it's a landlord and they're leasing to a marijuana related business, it's likely that the, you know, that that the funds they'll be taking in is from the sale of marijuana. So that that's actually one of the examples. If it's discovered that an institution is banking a tier three MRB against its own internal policy, is the expectation that the relationship be ended? Well, I mean, a high level, I would say, yes, if you have a policy approved by the board that says you are not going to bank these individuals, um, then you have a relationship that's against policy. So I don't know what you would do. But but here's the thing. Um, appropriate risk mitigation, then you, it understands that you're going to have preventative controls. So you're going to say, no, we're not going to do this. We, we're, and we're asking questions to make sure that we don't get these types of relationships but you also have contingency controls, right? And that's something that a lot of programs tend to miss. What it's it's a foreseeable event, particularly if you're in an area where there is lawful marijuana sales. Um, it's foreseeable that you may have a marijuana-related business, whether it's tier one, two, or three, depending on how you've defined it. Um, so what what are you going to do then? That's a contingency control. So I would say your program should lay out exactly how that's going to work. If you have an MRB sneak through, uh, you know, your preventative controls, what are you going to do? Are you going to close the account? Um, are you going to submit it to your BSA officer for a risk analysis? Um, is there going to be a management decision? I would say uh, update your program so that you have a contingency control in place where you say, okay, um, we are not going to bank marijuana related businesses but if we do or and and this does happen if we determine that one of our current customers actually becomes a marijuana related business what is our process and so i would say that that's the way i would approach it rather than just closing these things down from what you have seen are the majority of community banks banking these tier 3 mrbs uh, I'm seeing more and more of them get comfortable with it. Uh, when the guidance first came out, I saw a lot of programs said that they were going to avoid all level of marijuana related business. Um, but as time goes by, uh, it's it's really becoming more difficult to do. Um, so what I would say is uh, lay out in your program exactly what an approval process would look like. Um, define the marijuana related business, break it out into usable chunks so that you can actually work with it and say what types of businesses on a high level you're willing to work with and which ones you're not. Uh, and then if you do have a marijuana related business that you've determined is maybe you're going to accept some low risk, uh, develop a clear customer risk profile so that you can actually um, manage and distinguish between which relationships are you going to deal are you going to deal with and which ones are you going to avoid? Should we be actively trying to identify any existing MRB customers if our policy says we will not bank them? I uh, absolutely yes. If you if you've determined that you're not going to bank and 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 that's what it sounds like you said across the board we're not going to bank any marijuana related businesses. Um, 
you you should be monitoring. I mean, first you're going to be asking on the front end to determine that you don't. Um, but appropriate risk management is never see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. I mean, you you do have to have some level of monitoring just to verify that you don't have one of these higher risk customers uh, that has snuck in, you know, under the radar, and you're not appropriately managing that risk. So uh, it could be questions, it could be part of your monitoring program, or it could be as simple as training your staff to be on the lookout. Uh, for these types of relationships and then letting them know what they're supposed to do if they do run into one. So, Okay. All right. We're going to move on from MRVs, at least for a time. What is the difference between a resident alien and a non-resident alien? Really, that's that's kind of laid out. It's mostly it's immigration law, but uh, the, the distinction, um, and, I, and I used to do a little bit of immigration law, so I know just enough to be dangerous, but uh, Okay, so the main difference is for taxation purposes. Okay, so that that's a distinction out there. Um, they they are um, resident aliens and non-resident aliens. Really, it's kind of broken down on on how they're being taxed. Uh, generally speaking, you make that transition from a non-resident alien to a resident alien um, after you've been granted a green card or or passed. There's a, there's a test that they they apply to you to say if you have a substantial presence. So in other words, are you are you in the country on a relatively permanent basis? But uh, for the most part, that distinction it's it's more of a taxation distinction. I understand that we will receive a final rule from FinCEN in September on beneficial ownership. Do you have any suggestions on how we go about educating our customers now and making them aware that changes are coming, even though we have nothing concrete from FinCEN? Yes, that's a, that's actually, a, I'm glad that you're thinking about it first off. But uh, so just so we're all on the same page here, there is a national database for beneficial owner information that Vincent is working on. And there's a final rule that's going to come out in September. Okay, so now that rule doesn't apply. It doesn't change our beneficial owner rules. So our industry isn't changing yet. However, the Treasury is going to give us new rules uh, you know, once that new database is up and running and working, our industry is going to get new rules coming up a little bit later. But here's the problem, and this is what they're identifying, is that the your customers are going to have to comply with this new database rule. So they're probably going to be confused. And here's the thing. A lot of your customers, the only time they ever heard beneficial owner was when they came into the bank and talked to you about it. So um, I think it's a good idea to go out and start figuring out how are you going to deal with these questions, right? Your customers are going to come in. They're going to be confused. And so how are you as a financial institution going to deal with this? And it, it, it could be that you just let them know, hey, we're not lawyers here. You need to go and talk to a lawyer, um, which isn't very good customer service. So you may you may not want to go that route. But at the same time, you may want to give them that caveat if you are going to help them. Um, but I would I would train up your frontline staff so they could at least give the basics so they can say what the requirements are, um, where that registration might occur, what what a beneficial owner is. There's penalties for failure, you know, maybe at least giving them enough information so they can communicate with your customers in a helpful way. Now, do you want to go out and affirmatively go through this process for them and get them registered? I would say you know, that I would proceed with caution because they're, like I said, now we're getting into more of a legal issue. Um, you know, so I would say maybe at least getting them information so that they can do what they need to, to comply with the rule, as opposed to uh, just ignoring it or going out and actively trying to do it for them. We currently have a money service business or MSB that snuck under the radar. What is the best documentation to get from them since they use an agent for their MSB transactions? Also, what are things we should be watching and monitoring for? Okay, well, if they're you, it's a money service business that came in under the radar. Well, uh, it's if, either way, there is guidance out there. So the first thing I would do is, uh, you know, go and look up the MSB guidance and see what types of enhanced due diligence you need to have in place. It's going to be things like you you need to understand how their, uh, their, their products and services work. What is the activity that they're actually involved in? Um, if they do have an agent, you need to understand what that agent's role in the process is. Then you need to go through and figure out, okay, are they are they required to be licensed? And if they are, 
do they have that proper license in place? So uh, again, uh, the, the monitoring, I would go to the MSB guidance that's out there, go to, uh, it's, it's, it's on the uh, FFIEC website. Um, start looking through that and start building your enhanced due diligence program because once you have one of these as a customer, um, you're going to have to monitor them appropriately, and you're going to have to have uh, you're going to have to be asking the right questions, having some level of monitoring in there. But it all starts off with that initial risk assessment where you figure out what are they actually doing and what is the relationship with that agent. When a customer has attempted fraud transactions that are caught and returned under twenty five thousand with no suspects, with no suspect, do we have to file a SAR? Okay, so I'm going to assume on this when they say their customer attempted a fraud transaction that they were the victim of fraud and that they're not participating in it. Because if they're participating or you think that they might be going along with it, well, now you have a suspect and and because your customer may potentially be involved in it. Now, but let, let's assume that they're not. If that's the case, um, you know, you haven't identified who the perpetrator is. So uh, you didn't meet the actual threshold of that 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 trigger. So you would still document your investigation um, and, and make the determination, make it clear why you're not filing a SAR. Uh, but that being said, you do have the authority. You could go through and file that SAR anyway. If you would like to, you can do a voluntary SAR as well. With the added emphasis on countering the financing of terrorism or CFT, should institutions change the name of their BSA AML program to AML CFT now? And are there any other required changes to the policy or procedures with this shift? Yes. Okay. So uh, with the new, uh, the 2020 act that came out, so the, the uh, regulation that's that's changing everything going forward, they use that acronym, AMLCTF. And, and some of the regulators are even using that. I believe the uh, FDIC came out and they said they're going to use the AML. CFT acronym going forward. So, uh, you know, do you have to change the name of your program? Well, there isn't anything that specifically says that. And if you remember, you know, last administration, they were using the acronym L or MLTF or Money Laundering Terrorist Financing. So they are kind of swapping around some of the acronyms. Uh, what I would say is uh, there isn't a, a specific trigger that says you have to change that acronym. But what I would do is at least sprinkle that acronym into your program here and there. Maybe you don't rename your BSA AML program, but you start speaking in terms of AML CTF to demonstrate to your examiners that you know what's going on. Now, uh, you know, so it's but there isn't anything that says you have to rename your program or change the name of your policy or anything along those lines. Um, now, there is interagency guidance that's out there and it's changing going forward. And they do say you should incorporate these AML CTF priorities that are out there. So uh, what I would do is go out, look up the those those priorities that are that are available to you and then incorporate those into your program at the very least i would incorporate into your uh uh into your risk assessment we have a consumer loan application from the president of a cannabis company the source of repayment is personal income would it be a best practice to file on this since the funds used for repayment would be from the cannabis industry yeah, uh, my so my biggest gripe about the guidance that's out there, we have guidance on marijuana-related businesses. The problem is the guidance leaves a lot of gray areas. It talks in terms of marijuana-related business, and then it speaks in terms of transactions that you uh, you know or you're likely to know are from the proceeds of the sale of marijuana, um, but it doesn't specifically talk about individuals. And that's kind of one of the biggest gripes and it's created a lot of confusion out there. So it's it's left this area kind of ambiguous. Um, so, so I understand where the question's coming from, but in, in my opinion, since it, it sounds like you've got uh, transactions that are coming into the bank in the form of you know these loan payments that you'll be getting, and they're likely the proceeds from the sale of marijuana, I, I think the logic of the of the guidance still applies so i would i would still file even though it's a little ambiguous in the guidance i would still file under those circumstances what is the best way to register for 314b 
And is there anything we should know before about starting to participate in sharing under 314B? Yes. Okay. So 314B, what I would encourage you to do is there is a brand new fact sheet that came out. So you can just Google 314 fact sheet and it came out in the last couple of years. I can't remember if it was one year ago or two years ago, but uh, I would read through that because it really lays it out in a very digestible way. Um, there is a website that you can go to and, and the first step is to register and make sure that you, you get registered. Um, and then you also have to have internal proceed or internal practices to make sure that any information you share or any information that you receive rather is is actually treated confidentially. So you need to have some internal proceeds if you're going to register. And then just how is 314 be used? I, well, again, it, it creates uh, 314, it, it creates a, a safe harbor. So you can, uh, you know, you can share information with other financial institutions. So really the way the reg or the law lays it out is you are permitted to, uh, once you've provided notice to the, the government, so you've registered under 314B, um, then you're allowed to share information so long as you've done, first, you've got to verify that the other financial institution is also registered. And then you have to have internal steps to make sure you safeguard that information. Once you have those three things lined up, you've registered, you've verified they are registered and you've taken steps to safeguard that information, um, then, you're, you, then you're allowed to share information as it pertains to money laundering and terrorist activity. Um, this next one is back to those new beneficial owner information reporting requirements starting one one twenty four. You already kind of touched on um, if it will have an impact on financial institutions. Will anyone be required to verify this information has been reported? Well, there's there's going to be an impact, and we know that the Treasury. So they're they're putting together this uh, the the, um, the database that's going to be out there. Um, then the treasury, once the database is in place, the treasury is going to lay out rules for our industry. Um, so first step is right now it's business as usual. We follow our normal, you know, beneficial owner rules. What those new rules are going to look like at this point, it's anybody's guess. It could depend on, you know, which administration is in charge at any given point when, when those rules are actually, uh, released, there's going to be a notice and comment period as well. So it's really hard to say if you're going to have to independently verify that registration status or, or verify that they, they are lawfully registered. Now it's a possibility, um, but but that's that being said right now, I would focus on uh, kind of what that other question was about is, is, is this impact that your customers are going to have. Um, and then once we get our marching orders, that's when I would start worrying about, okay, what, are we going to have to have a ver verification process or not? Because really, at, at this point, uh, it's anybody's guess. What I do know is that there are limitations on who's going to have access uh, to this database. So how you would go about verifying their registration status, um, it's a little up, up in the air on what that's going to look like. So I, I have a feeling that that's probably going to evolve uh, especially when we go through that notice and comment period. We have a non-customer who cashed a check drawn on our institution. The check was made payable to person A, but brought in and cashed by the POA. We collected ID and POA papers, but nothing more than the address information for the payee, person A, who is also a non-customer. I completed a part one for the POA and a second part one for the payee or person A. Should I use unknown for the ID for person A or should I select other and put in the power of attorney papers? You know, I would go with unknown for the ID of person A. And, and here's why the, the, the power of attorney papers and, you know, whatever their, their identification, that's not a form of identification really for that person. Uh, so I, I would say you'd have to put an unknown. When we file an initial marijuana limited SAR, do we need to list the number of transactions and amounts of each deposit withdrawal, or do we just list that on the continuing SARs? Okay, so th now this is this is confusing because in the actual 
guidance, it makes it, <laughs> it makes it a little fuzzy on what you're supposed to include in that original one. Um, because the way it lays it out is, is, is it says, okay, you give the identifying information and the address and everything about the, the subjects. And then it goes on in the guidance and says, for the continuing SAR, you give them the amount of deposits and the withdrawn you know, amounts and things along those lines. Um, but to me, logic would dictate that, you know, if you're going to be giving that information on the continuing SAR, um, you should also include it on that original SAR, um, even though it's not very clear in the guidance that that's, it, that's specifically how it's supposed to work. So the way I would do it is I would, I would include um, those deposit amounts in the original because to me, logic says that they're going to be asking that on continuing SARS as well. So you might as well continue, include it on the first one. We have business customers that conduct, we have a business customer that conducts cash activity for two separate businesses that when aggregate trigger a CTR. We do not consider these businesses related, but we report the CTR as the conductor is bringing in over $10,000 in cash. If we want to exempt these businesses, would each of them need to complete at least five transactions over the $10,000 threshold? I would say yes, because if you've if you've looked at these two businesses and from your perspective they are operating independently, then yeah, they you know they would have they would you wouldn't be able to aggregate them for purposes of CTR. So each business would have to independently reach that threshold that that five transactions over ten thousand dollars in the course of twelve months, uh, and then they both would also have to meet all of the other um, eligibility requirements as well. We have two separate entities located in two separate towns with the same beneficial owner. We're struggling with determining whether we should be aggregating their transactions for CTR purposes. Okay, well, so the the guidance, uh, they're, the, they're the CTR rules, actually, they, they say that unless you have an affirmative reason, so you have to have a reason to believe that they are not operating independently. So you're, you're supposed to assume that these two businesses are separate entities because they're separate legal entities, um, even if they have the same owner up top, um, unless you make this, uh, this affirmative decision to say that, you know what, we don't believe these are separate anymore. So you'll look at things like, say, are they um, maybe the two businesses have all the same employees. Maybe they're operated out of the same address. Maybe we're seeing money coming from one business account into the other business account to pay bills or something along those lines. And then you would go through and at that like at that customer uh, risk profile level, at that, that relationship level, then you would make the determination that, yes, these are we, we don't believe these two entities are operating separately. And if you make that decision, then I would aggregate uh, the, you know, those deposits together for CTR purposes. If you have a DBA that operates under a federal tax ID number, do we need beneficial ownership papers? I sounds like they it sounds like they're talking about a sole proprietor. So if they are, then um, beneficial ownership information is not required. So just because they're a sole proprietor and just because they have a federal tax ID number, it doesn't mean that they're a legal entity. So under those circumstances, they, they would not need that beneficial owner information. Now, for customer due diligence perspective, you might want to get it, but, uh, you know, or at least have, you know, information about that sole proprietor. But, but again, it's not a legal entity under the rule. If our customer leases a space in his business for a Bitcoin ATM, but does not own it, what CDD needs to be done? Ooh, that's a that's a good question. Now, there isn't specific guidance out there on, on Bitcoin ATMs, um, but where I would start, because, you know, this is high risk activity, right? So we know that if they've got a Bitcoin ATM, it's higher risk. Um, I would start with the guidance on normal ATMs. Um, with the understanding that this Bitcoin ATM is probably relatively higher risk just because of the kind of association with cryptocurrency. Um, so, you know, I'd go through the logic, figure out, okay, where's the location? Um, is that area where this business is located? Is it in a, you know, is it in a high crime area? Um, maybe reach out to them and figure out, you know, just kind of get the logic on why they have this out there. Um, verifying that the the operator of this uh, Bitcoin ATM is uh, appropriately licensed and registered. Um, and then, you know, maybe even getting a copy of that agreement, 
Um, and then, you know, maybe to some level, depending on the risk, once you've looked into it, figuring out, is there any way that you can monitor the transaction activity? That's, that's re I would, I would really start with those ATM rules and then just build off of that with the understanding that, you know, cryptocurrency kind of ratchets up the potential risk there. If we have multiple ATM transactions where the individual deposits were each less than 10,000, but together they exceed the 10,000, do we mark the aggregated transaction box if none of them occurred at the teller line? Okay, so if you go to the, inst the CTR instructions, uh, it's, it's pretty clear in the instructions. It says the only time that you check that box for aggregated transactions is when one of those transactions was conducted at the teller line. So the logic being um, at that teller, if there was a teller transaction, you should have got the identification, right? Because you would have known, yeah, it's over that $10,000 threshold. We're going to ID the, the person conducting the transaction. Um, but, you know, since, since you didn't have somebody at that teller line, um, then you wouldn't click that aggregated transactions box. So that, yeah, I, I, the instructions are pretty clear on that. We have a customer eligible for a CTR exemption, but I have some reservations in exempting them because of prior activities. And we even filed a SAR earlier this year. Is it wrong for us to keep filing CTRs or is it up to our discretion? Uh, there, there is no requirement that you have a CTR exemption. So you are, you are allowed to go through if you have, you, you're allowed to exempt an eligible non-listed business. And um, however, really think of it this way. If you're going to exempt a customer from CTR transactions, really what you're doing is you're telling the government, um, we don't want to file all these CTRs. They have a lot of cash activity. So we are going to monitor them in you know, for you, or we're going to monitor them on our own. And that's why you have to go through that, that annual review process for your, uh, your, you know, your, your designated companies. And you have to also monitor them for suspicious activity. So I, you're never required to exempt them. So I would say if you already have um, some suspicion about this relationship, and if you've already filed some SARS, uh, in my opinion, I, I, if, if you have hesitancy about designating them, I would say, no, there's nothing that says you have to do it. What would you recommend that our program do today in response to the situation in Russia and the new sanctions? All right. Well, uh, if, you, if you've if you ever attended any of my uh, training webinars, I always say the tip of the day is update your risk assessment. So that's what I would do today. I would go through and I would I would acknowledge that uh, first off, there's there's been a lot of guidance over the last 18 months. Um, there's been several uh, specific areas of guidance that came through from FinCEN. So I researched those really quick and, and make sure that you're kind of up to speed on the types of activity that we're looking for and the types, uh, because they do a very good job of laying out, okay, um, these are the areas of higher risk. This is the type of transaction activity that, that we're looking for. And once you've kind of digested that a little bit, then do your risk assessment and say, okay, what is our risk level here? And uh, if you are seeing some of that activity or some of that higher risk activity, um, then what are you going to do to mitigate it? Are you going to have special monitoring in place? Are you going to maybe some special training? One of the um, pieces of guidance that came out from FinCEN was specifically talking about um, Russian sanctions evasion in commercial uh, transaction, commercial real estate transactions. Um, so then the question is, maybe you need some additional training. Maybe you need to train your commercial uh, lenders to be on the lookout for those specific red flags that that guidance said to be on the lookout for. Um, one of the other pieces of guidance talks about um, high value uh, or high ticket items. So like yachts or um, uh, jewelry or art or things along those lines. So knowing that, do you have you assessed that risk? Is there is there the risk of those types of transactions going through your financial institution? And if it is, then maybe you need monitoring, or maybe you need some specific type of training to be in place to to mitigate that. So uh, again, tip of the day is always update your risk assessment, and then see is there any area that you need to update, or maybe provide some training, or maybe you know some other type of monitoring in place, or maybe beefing up your enhanced customer due diligence in, in some areas. So uh, 
Tip of the day, update your risk assessment. If we have a known customer who conducts CTR reportable transactions weekly, do you recommend requiring their ID each time or can we just keep a copy on file for these purposes? Now, the, the rules say that you can rely, if you have identification information on file, you can rely on that. So, uh, you know, so there isn't anything that says you have to get it every single time. Um, that being said, from a customer due diligence perspective, it's probably a good idea to go out and, and get it at least every once in a while. Um, because your customer due diligence requirements are you're supposed to be keeping up-to-date information on your customers over time. So I would say at least request it occasionally or maybe annually or something along those lines. I, I you know, I, I wouldn't just sleep on the fact that, okay, well, we got there, uh, we, we see IP'd them years and years and years ago, and that's going to be just fine. We're going to keep using that ID. ID. Um, to me, that would that would indicate that there might be a problem with your customer due diligence program. So uh, no requirement that you do it every time, but at the same time, I would update it periodically. We have an ag customer who is interested in producing hemp. How often should we be monitoring and any suggestions on how that monitoring should look? Yeah, good, good question. Um, so you have some flexibility with hemp. And the good news is, uh, over the last couple of years, we've actually, Fenson has released some additional guidance specifically for hemp-related business. So we had the marijuana-related business guidance that came out. Uh, then we had the, the law that came through that created the hemp loophole. I say it was the Agricultural Improvement Act that came out. And then on the heels of that, uh, Finston gave us some guidance specifically for hemp-related business. And the good news is it actually lays out specifically the types of things that you should be doing. So uh, first off, again, determining what type of hemp production they're involved in, determine what their risk level is. You know, So uh, a customer that's producing hemp for a well-established company and they've been doing it for a long time, that's going to be a different risk profile then maybe a brand new hemp producer that is is just kind of getting their feet under them. And so you'll you'll want to go through, do your risk assessment, and then align your monitoring uh, with that level of risk that you've determined. But uh, first step, I would say, is, is go out, look for that hemp-related business guidance from FinCEN because it's a great framework to get you started. If we have someone that appears to have structured a couple of cash withdrawals, would you de deem it suspicious and file a SAR or wait to see if the activity continues? You know, it's, I mean, you you could wait uh, for at least for a little time. I mean, not not all, I mean, sometimes it's a coincidence. You know, they came in with, uh, you know, they just happen to have that amount uh, to, trend, you know, to deposit over the course of a couple of, of days. Um, so, but if it still seems like there's no other legitimate reason for the fact that for them to deposit in that, uh, you know, in, in the way that they did, that appears to have been structured, um, you know, maybe you'll you'll want to file it at that point. But uh, but again, you may have an auditor that will come in and ask why you didn't. So either way, I would investigate it, make a determination, maybe. You, uh, that first structuring event was just the trigger and it triggered enhanced due diligence. So you're going to monitor them for a little while. And uh, you may see that that activity discontinues. So you make the determination, we're not going to file a SAR or anything along those lines. Um, or, I mean, there's nothing that says that you can't file it. If you really think that, if you determine that you think they actually were st structuring, uh, then you can file your SAR. Say a customer brings in $14,000 cash and pays a loan off with $13,600. The teller gives the customer $400 back in change. Is the CTR filed on $14,000 or for the $13,600 and why? Yeah, uh, for, for CTRs, keep in mind, we are, we are all, we're monitoring all of the cash in activity. And then we're separately monitoring cash out activity. So in this case, and you're not netting one against the other on any particular day. So in this case, the, the 14000 coming in is what you would file your CTR on. You would not take out that $400 in cash. For CTR exemption purposes, is it sufficient to rely on an attestation from the business that no more than 50% of their revenue is derived from any ineligible activities? 
Okay, so for these exemptions, uh, you are required to go out and, uh, you know, and verify that they still meet the requirements on, on an annual basis. And so then the question is, uh, you know, and, and one of the restrictions is they can't have uh, you know, they can't be getting more than 50% of their revenue from certain restricted activities. So the question is, can you rely on an, an attestation or can you rely on them telling you, you know, just on its own that we, no, we don't spend or we don't get more than that much money from this type of activity. And, you know, really it's a risk-based determination. You can, I would say it's acceptable to rely on them signing off saying that they don't. Um, but I would get it on an annual basis. And if you have any reason that you wouldn't believe uh, that the customer for the numbers that they're giving you or the fact that they say, you know, like, let's say gambling or something along those lines, they say, nope, we don't get over 50% of our, our income from gambling. But for whatever reason, you don't really trust what they're telling you. That opens up a whole nother can of worms. But if there's no reason to doubt them and you feel like there there's a low risk that they would be over that threshold, um, I wouldn't have a problem if you relied on that attestation, as long as you were getting it on an annual basis. And this is kind of a follow-up. Are SARS required for entities who receive any funds from an MRB? For example, is a SAR required on a company that sells baggies to a dispensary? Uh, uh, well, I mean, you can, while you can consider those SAR thresholds, if you look at the marijuana related business specific guidance, they don't, they don't have that de minimis exception that's out there. And it seems it's kind of its own animal. So uh, I would say, yeah, if you detected those transactions, it, it would trigger that marijuana limited uh, because you do know that those funds that, that are paying for those baggies, those are from the sale of of legalized marijuana. Even if it's legal at the state level, it's still illegal at the federal level. For suspicious activity monitoring, what types of activities do you see or would you be on the alert for in the customer service or call center area? Oh, for a call center. Well, it really kind of depends on what exactly they're doing at the call center. So do they have, you know, do they have access to transaction idea, do they they do they get reports on overdrafts or kiting alerts or any kind of ACH activity or fraud or anything along those lines? Whatever reports they might be getting, I would incorporate that into your monitoring. Now, if they're taking calls, um, you know, then then they should be on the lookout for things like potential identity theft. Is there somebody who is struggling with that your ID? Uh, verification process, or if they're uh, if somebody's asking a lot of strange questions, do the people who are in the call center taking those calls do they know what they're to be on the lookout for? Um, when I do uh, so, so we do a, a, a BSA training for the front lines, and in, 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 in that webinar, really, I, I tell folks to just be on the lookout for things that are unusual. So. Do they have enough information about individual customers that call in? Do they have access to some kind of customer's profile to determine whether or not the questions they're asking or the, the, the situation that they're involved in, is that unusual for that customer? And if that's the case, then, or if it seems that that's a little bit off, then maybe they should be following, you know, some kind of uh, unusual activity report that can be escalated up for further investigation. So, you know. Don't know if I answered that correctly or not, but. <laughs> what type of SAR filings would require immediate attention to law enforcement? Now, that, that can be a, a subjective uh, determination, but really just keep in mind, uh, you know, there's a number of things that might require immediate action. You know, if anything involved in terrorist activity or terrorist financing um, then I would get involved with uh, uh, law enforcement pretty quickly. If there is uh, criminal activity that's actually in, pro in process, then I would make sure, okay, if it looks like there's a crime in process, then maybe reach out to, to law enforcement. Um, there's also guidance out there for elder financial exploitation that says if, uh, if you suspect that there is elder financial exploitation and that's ongoing, that you should be reaching out to law enforcement. So, uh, and then also if you think that, there's there's a way that you can prevent some kind of significant loss, um, then yeah, I would I would act immediately. Can an internal auditor conduct our annual independent audit? 
Um, they, they can. So you could have an internal auditor that does your independent review. You would just need to prove that they are completely independent. Um, so they cannot be involved in any aspect of your BSA AML program. Um, but then also you would have to prove that they were qualified. So a lot of financial institutions, I mean, that's a luxury to have um, BSA AML experts to manage your BSA program, but then to also have a BSA AML expert that is not involved in your program and is just there to audit the program. So um, you do have to establish those two things. It would be, it, in a lot of cases, that's where the problem is, is you, you're not able to uh, demonstrate that this auditor actually has the expertise to conduct a valid independent review. So that that while it's possible, you just want to make sure you check those box off and you're documenting their qualifications really well, uh, because the last thing you want is to have a problem with your independent review. And this is another follow-up. On a marijuana limited SAR, would we list our customer as a subject or just the MRB they are receiving the funds from or both? Yeah. Uh, so if, you're, if your customer is receiving the funds from a marijuana-related business, that's a transaction that you know is likely from the proceeds of marijuana. So yeah, they would also be a subject because they'd be receiving the proceeds from the sale of marijuana. So yeah, they would be, um, yeah, they, they would be included as a subject and I would include their information um, in the narrative of your SAR. If we file a SAR on insider abuse, do we notify the board of that fact or give additional details? Uh, in in most cases, I would say that the board would need to know about insider abuse. I mean, they they need to know enough about your SAR activity so that they can do their job. And if if you have detected some kind of insider abuse at any level, I think that's relevant to what the board of directors should know. So, when I trust, sorry, did you have anything else on that one? Nope. I was just going to say I think we're we're coming down to the wire here. So uh, let's let's do one more here. Okay. When a trust is a beneficiary of an account, do we need to complete beneficial ownership forms? Okay. So the, tr the trust is the beneficiary of the account, um, but they're not, they're not a beneficial owner because the trust is not a legal entity. So if they're, if it depends on, yeah. So the trust would not, uh, would, would not have to complete beneficial owner forms. Now, if you had a legal entity and the trust is one of the owners or is the, is the beneficial owner of the legal entity, um, then you would have to identify the trustee on the forms itself. Uh, but, but generally, in most cases, a trust is not a legal entity that would require beneficial owner documentation. Uh, the exception being in some states, there are legal trusts where that would qualify as a legal entity, but generally that's where you have to go to like the secretary of state, or you have to go to the government and actually create that trust. And if that's the circumstances, um, then you would have to follow beneficial owner rules, but those are the exceptions. I, I know there's only a few states that actually have those types of legal entity trusts. Wow. <laughs> I can't believe it. We're, we, 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 we've, we've got to a lot of questions. Uh, that might be a record for the BSA AML. Well done, Kevin. Well done, Diane. I know we didn't get to everybody's questions. The idea here is to get to as many as we possibly can. Like I said, I think we break, broke a record here. Uh, I've got just a couple of closing comments. Again, thank you to Kevin and Diane uh, for the wonderful job there. Kevin, you mentioned several webinars. Uh, a lot of the topics that we talked about here today, if you want more extensive information on it, check out our library of available upcoming live as well as on demand. Uh, if you don't see what you're looking for, like I mentioned at the top of the hour when we started off that uh, to reach out to us, maybe we've packaged it as something else or called it something different or we need to customize it for you and your teammates. I also want to thank Kyla Kroger, our training coordinator, for helping out behind the scenes today. She runs the chat and really takes care of all the behind the scenes action going on with all of our uh, virtual events. And then Amy Kudlachik, she was working the chat room today. Uh, thank you for your efforts as well. Uh, I want to share just a couple of things before everybody takes off here today. I promise it'll just be a minute. I want to share my screen to do so. So bear with me just a second. So today's program was recorded. Um, you'll get information about how you can download that and when you can download that. Uh, again, went through a lot of questions. You'll likely want to go back and listen to some of those or maybe have some of your teammates listen to it. So stay tuned for that uh, in, the, in the coming days. 
Uh, the We do this forum thing four times a year. The first three that we do in the year are Q&A. So we've done lending. We did deposits today. Kevin tackled the BSA AML Q&A. The fourth one that we do, and it's coming up in October, and you can register for that immediately if you'd like, is a little bit different. It's a look back and what lies ahead. We do it each year. It's uh, my favorite of the four. They're all fantastic. It's my favorite one of the four, though, because uh, the feedback we get from all of you is that Boy, it made sure it helped me make sure I didn't miss something. It gave me some some fuel to 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 put on the uh, the management or the board agenda for things to look forward to down the road. And so, make sure you get your team registered for that. Uh, these forums are all free. We'd love to have you be in attendance. As we close out today and get you back to, to what you all do best, and that's serving your customers, if you do me a favor, just give us a little bit of feedback on the program today. There's a survey, five short questions, take you less than a minute to let us know how we did today. With that, on behalf of the team here at Bankers Compliance Consulting, we want to thank you for stopping by and we want to let you get back to those customers that you serve so well. We'll see you again next time.